You were listening to episode 187 of Mighty Life Radio. I'm Matt Blackburn, and today I'm interviewing my friend Jan Roman on Lyme disease. Jan is a functional nutrition trained practitioner, and he's studying to be an MD. We've been friends online for several years, and we both share an interest in experimenting with different supplements. Uh, He's a fellow tobacco enjoyer, which is really cool. And he was inspired by Ray Pete, as I was. So in this interview, he shares his journey of recovering from Lyme disease, and he shares some really fascinating things that helped him recover, including specific herbal tinctures, uh, a type of cannabis paste. And he also shares what helped him to reintroduce carbohydrates since he cut them out for several years. So enjoy the interview. Here is Jan Roman. All right, we're here with Jan Roman. Welcome to the show. Hey, Matt, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I've been following you since the quantum health days with with Jack Cruz in the Facebook group. And I've been seeing the way you've changed and uh, and you've influenced my health journey a lot. So I appreciate you having me. And I thank you very much for the influence you've had on all the information and all the knowledge I've gathered. It's great to be talking with you right now. I appreciate that. Yeah, maybe we should just leave in the middle. All right. <laughs> this, is, see that. this is my third in-person interview and doing it with my friend here, Jan. We've been friends online for maybe, I don't know, four, three, four years? Something yeah, like something like that. We've been chatting. And uh, yeah, I love the material that, that you put out and just bouncing ideas back and forth. And you have such an interesting... Um, story recovering from Lyme disease, which we're going to talk about in the show, um, but also just the experiments that you've done and looking forward to chatting about that. So Sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> let's dive into it. Awesome. So how did your health journey begin? Was it with Lyme and like getting that diagnosis or how did that all play out? Yeah, so that's when it got serious. Uh, but A few years before that, I was just into fitness, um, sprinting, a little bit of weightlifting with friends, um, a lot of calisthenics that I did in the park, and I was always looking for information. So really, it started out with bodybuilding magazines in in high school, I guess you could say. But um, quickly, I started to realize that those types of products and that type of lifestyle isn't really sustainable or healthy long term. So I started getting into natural testosterone optimization, you know, I guess young high school guys are always interested in that type of stuff. So I started eating more avocados, <laughs> uh, making raw ginger tea, um, running around in the hot sun and stuff like that. And that was all fun and games. And then really what, what triggered a more serious approach for me was when my father got diagnosed with rheumatic arthritis and everything at home changed. We had to radically alter our diet. We got rid of a lot of the things that most people in our circles don't really, uh, don't really eat or maybe eat in very, very different forms like wheat. You know, now people are eating sourdough bread, but uh, a lot of the bread that's available right now, uh, we eliminated uh, at my house. Um, a lot of the processed sugar went away, which now we've got a different opinion on as well. But at the time it really worked wonders for my dad to get rid of that. And so our diet changed a lot and, and, um, and we, we got, a water filter for the fluoride. I started drinking green tea with my dad and I started seeing that, you know, these things really do have an effect and the things you do in your daily life can really alter how you approach life, the things you're interested about, your curiosity level, your productivity. And so, um, once I saw my dad recover, I, I thought this is it, you know, I'm going, this is going to be my career one way or another. I had no idea how it would work out, but, uh, I'm still on that path right now and getting more and more serious about it. And so that was the beginning. Yeah, very rudimentary. I do want to mention that the interesting part, uh, one of the reasons why it was so profound was that the lady who was uh, helping my father at the time, she herself had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and she dove into books and, mm-hmm. and uh, articles and all sorts of stuff. And she got herself out of multiple sclerosis. Mm-hmm. And then once the conventional medical approach failed, or, or really didn't do much other for my dad other, other than condemn him to, you know, cortical steroids. 
which seems to be the answer for pretty much all the chronic illnesses nowadays. Um, she, she got him out of that as well. Uh, the improvements were incredible. I mean, within a few weeks, he was drastically, uh, drastically a difference, more, much more positive state of health. So seeing that and seeing her story for me, that kind of solidified the deal. And that's how it began. Hmm. Wow. And where, where did the line start? <laughs> yeah, well, that was, it was pretty, it, it followed, I think, uh, somewhere near the end of high school was my father's uh, story. That's where, that's where his issues began and were thankfully very quickly resolved. Um, for me, it was, I think, for very soon in the beginning of college, I was out on a trip um, April of 2014, I think it was, and I got, I actually had a deer tick, which was the one thing that really clued me in and, and that connected all the dots for me later on. Thankfully, I found that tick because I think it would have taken a lot longer for me to figure out what was going on had I not seen that. Um, so I did have that deer tick then. I had no symptoms, no rash, nothing, no, no fever. Um, and what happened was uh, later that summer, I was landscaping uh, just as a summer job around this factory and lo and behold there was some poison ivy or some kind of other i don't know if it was oak or sumac probably ivy and um and i got that on my leg and cortical steroids were the next prescription because i had had a very serious reaction to that when i was young and i was going on trips so i just got that prescription out of the way as soon as possible started taking the cortical steroids i knew they weren't great but i thought you know what i really want to go on this trip i don't want to pass it up and, um, and so the immunosuppression is what allowed the bacteria to really start wreaking havoc. Mm -hmm. And the first symptom was, uh, was that my knees started to feel like unstable. The tendons started to feel stringy, um, mm -hmm. or ropey, you know, however you would describe it. Some people who have experienced tendonitis can probably relate. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was due to overtraining at the time I was lifting a lot. I was squatting, um, a few times a week. So I, I thought, all right, I'll take a break. And that break ended up being a few weeks. It turned into like two months and it, there was no improvement. There was only worsening. And I thought, all right, if, if, if it's not improving with rest, then it can't be tendonitis, mm -hmm. right? It's gotta be something more. And so I was bouncing back and forth in a lot of health groups, um, just reading some articles on joint health. And what ended up happening was I, uh, I was in a nootropics Facebook group and I was in touch with this one guy who was asking me a lot of questions and, um, asking me about his symptoms. And then he got back to me a little bit later because uh, I didn't have any answers for him. And he said, he said that he finally got a diagnosis and that it was Lyme. Hmm. And I read that message and I just got a cold sweat over uh -oh. my body. And I felt the, you know, the, the chest tightness hmm. and the, the rapid heart rate. And I'm thinking Lyme, Lyme. All right. Well, I had a, I had a tick, right? I had a, it was like halfway into my skin at that point. And I started to research the symptoms of Lyme, the rashes, the characteristic kind of border um the, where the redness is on the border and the, the the internal part of the rash is a little bit more pale or purplish um and the, the fact that the knees were the first thing that were, was attacked the fact that the other joints started kind of being involved as well like my hips and my mm -hmm. shoulders and i i uh, i pinpointed it at that point i said it has to be lime and so that's mm -hmm. where it began at that point, it was a relief to know what was going on. Um, I did some testing after that that was a little bit unhelpful, to say the least. And I researched why the test. Later on, I found out why the testing was so so difficult to really get any answers from. But um, that was how the Lyme started. Yeah. Wow. And what? Um, where did the tick like bite you? Where did you find it? So the tick was on the back of my leg. And if I recall, I mean, this was at this point, like eight years ago or more, um, but I just sat down, we were, I was with a group of friends and we we're in the forest and I sat down to take a break. I think it was on a log and I felt just something on the back of my thigh and I took a look at it. It was a tick. Um, so I had somebody take it out for me, but it, I don't know how much this matters because it was in there for a few hours for sure at that point. Um, but it definitely wasn't extracted in the medically professional ideal way, you know, but um, either way, it had a lot of time to release its contents into the blood by that point. And uh, yeah, that's how I found it. Thankfully enough, because, you know, like I said earlier, I, if, if I hadn't found that, I wouldn't have had the crucial point that really helped me to pinpoint the, the most likely cause of all my issues. Mm. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, Dr. Cass Ingram he used to talk about um was it Lyme or Plum Island, was it? Where yes. um and he he has I think the lecture is still up on YouTube, how he talks about how it was essentially a bioweapon that escaped and got to the states and it spread where it used to be, what was it, northeast US kind of area to even where now where they can be found in the southwest, north northwest, kind of everywhere, right? And it's only certain ticks that spread it, right? Yes, it's the uh, Ixodes tick, um, mm-hmm. the, the deer tick. So they're pretty small, which makes it difficult. You know, if it was the larger ticks, at least you'd have the kind of the warning sign of something crawling on you. But these things are really tiny. Yeah, they're in Europe now. Wow. Um, I am familiar with that uh, with that story. I think there's really very little room for doubt. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's this has been up for congressional review. Mm-hmm. The government has been confronted about this, and it's gone to the highest levels. Uh, and nothing has been you know, denied or, or, or disproven. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot to that. I mean, actually, funny enough, you mentioned Dr. Cass Ingram. So he, I met him at a Whole Foods uh, a few years back, and he was the one I, I told him. We, we got to talking a little bit. I was an employee there. And, um, and he mentioned oregano oil mm-hmm. at, the, at the time, and he just told me how much I should be taking daily. I started taking it, and it definitely helped me quite a bit as well. Um, mm-hmm. I love his products. <laughs> yeah. 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 He, he passed away, unfortunately, uh, earlier this year and just like oh, wow. suddenly, and it's kind of a little sketchy to me, but I don't know exactly what happens, but, uh, but yeah, his oregano protocol, I think he said it saved him. Like he just, when it was reaching his brain, I've heard his story multiple times. I think he said it on, on my show that, uh, like he could barely walk, you had people carry him, and he just started shooting. Like he would just dump a whole bottle, like a two ounce <laughs> bottle of wild oregano oil, into like a glass of water and just chug it. And he said, I think he did that once a day for four or five days or something. And uh, he said that broke the back of the lime, and he, re- he was able to recover after that. It's pretty fascinating. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> well, first of all, rest in peace, Dr. Ingram. I didn't know he passed away. Um, yeah, he was definitely a great man. Um, I owe part of my recovery to him, no doubt. Yeah, I, I uh, it's amazing to hear the stories of recovery for people or of people who who dealt with neuro Lyme, where where it reaches the brain and starts giving neurological symptoms. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, I never had that, so um, I was able to keep a clear head for most of my recovery, even during the hardest times. But I can only imagine how how dark that must be. But the fact that people recover from that is still fascinating and, and a, a real sign of hope. I know Dr. Dietrich Klinghart had Lyme twice, if I remember uh, correctly. I hope he, <laughs> I hope that's it, and that it, he's been okay ever since. But I last I heard uh, from the podcast I listened to, he was able to recover both times and learn more through each episode of Lyme and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but thankfully no neuro symptoms for me other than just kind of uh, brain fog and, and kind of this inflammation response. Hmm. Do, you, do you know, is there is there like a certain um, thing that makes the Lyme reach the brain? Like, do you know the reasoning why some some people get bit by the deer tick and it goes for their brain? Is it because they get bit close to the brain, like in their neck or in their head? I know some people have found it like in their hair, right? Right. Which is kind of freaky. and. I've heard some wild stories. I forget if it was a parasite, but it like bored a hole in someone's brain. Maybe it was a different type of creature, but um, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Like why it reaches the brain of some people and then others it doesn't? Yeah. I mean, I think it has primarily a lot to do with um, barrier permeability. So like, just like there's leaky gut, uh, that's, I think actually the first time I heard this was from Dr. Jack Cruz, where he mentioned how, even in the embryonic stage, the uh, the, t- the embryonic tissue that forms the lining of the gut is comes from the same endocrine tissue as the, the lining of the brain. Mm. So when you have a se- severe case of leaky gut or maybe, you know, leaky gut is kind of like this catch-all term, but you have intestinal inflammation, permeability, um, whether it's localized or, or throughout the, the, the GI tract, you're going to have some kind of breakdown of the brain barrier as well. It could also be something having to do with location of the of the tick bite. Yeah, no doubt. But uh, I I can't say much about that specifically. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be able to to really pinpoint any information on that. But um, 
it's just, it comes down to, you know, variability of individuals and the things they're dealing with. Cause like I said, I had zero symptoms. I was in perfect health. When I got the tick bite, hmm. I had no problems for months afterward. And it was only the cortical steroids that allowed those symptoms to come up. Um, and so I think it depends on the amount of immunosuppression someone's dealing with, the amount of stress they're dealing with, uh, that will determine and probably prior infections, maybe viral load, things like that, that will determine where those bacteria will be able to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I've heard that they, they mostly target like and everyone that gets the tick bite, um, with this deer tick or, or is that the only species that carries it or the main one or to my knowledge yeah there's different parasites um well i think babesia is also the same tick mm. uh, that's a, usually a co-infection that's mm. a parasite but i from what i know that's the only species that's mm. that, that carries that uh the lyme bacteria borrelia and all that okay yeah because this this winter i was kind of freaked out i was <laughs> outside um maintaining my goats and i went to open my shop door and um, I put it on my social media. I saw a little tick just hanging out on the door, and it could have easily fallen on me because it's one of those sliding, you know, doors, right? Like yeah. Garage doors type. And I looked up the tick, or I think someone told me in a message that I think it was a wood tick or something like that, or a or a dog tick. Like there's all these different species. Yeah, there's a bunch. Yep. And I think some people might have the misconception that all ticks can carry Lyme, but that's not true, right? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I mean, this is, <laughs> we probably need to dig into some classified materials <laughs> to really get down into it. But uh, the, the, the deer tick is the big one. And that one's the, the real danger. Mm -hmm. I think all ticks should be treated with caution. Mm -hmm. And if I were to get a tick bite that were more than just a superficial <laughs> attachment, I would probably, you know, get on some oregano oil, probably increase the methylene, methylene blue dose. Mm -hmm do a few other things for, for a few weeks just to make sure. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, the deer tick is the big one. People, people have said in podcasts that, you know, even mosquitoes can carry Lyme and all these. So mm. there's, there's no end to the speculation, mm. but I think that uh, it's probably safe to go with, with the information that's out there and that most people acknowledge that if it's a deer tick, you definitely want to get tested and, or, mm. or take some preventative preventive measures or precautions if you do get bit. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I, I think I've seen a list um, at one point of substances like plant compounds or extracts that are uh, anti lime. And I think oregano was, was definitely on the list. Um, but it seems like there's a bunch of them because what happens like the tick, it, it releases some material in and it's a, uh, and I think I've heard Cass talk about it. It's like a spiral, right? That's why it's called a spirochete. Yes. And it like it's like a corkscrew bacteria that like basically drills into your cells. Is that kind of right? Or yeah. So there's there's quite a bit of interesting and unique characteristics of the bacteria. Uh, and again, there's multiple different ones, right? There's Borrelia, Babesia is the parasite. Um, there's a few others that are that I don't have on the top of my mind right now. Um, but, or, or, or Lekia, there's the, there's mm -hmm. another one, but yeah, this, the main spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi, um, it's, it drills like that. It, it can, that's the, the motile technique that it uses to get into places. And then it can also form cysts. Mm -hmm. So it can kind of curl up into this little spore form and mm -hmm. pretty much hibernate inside cells in different places. Um, so, and the other thing that that the bacteria can do is that it uh, can constant. It's called antigenic variability, and every bacteria, as far as I know, has some ability to vary its antigens, uh, meaning that it the pro the proteins that coat the outer wall of the bacteria uh, it can pretty much mutate those genes and produce a slightly altered protein, mm -hmm. so that the antibodies that the body's producing are not effective against the new protein. So it's it's mm -hmm it's evading the immune system in that way. Oh. And, um, so that, that, that's what makes Lyme a difficult, difficult, uh, disease to heal once it becomes chronic mm -hmm. in the initial stages, uh, antibiotics, as far as I know, are, are quite effective. Doxycycline for like six weeks or a little bit longer works pretty well. When you have those initial symptoms, like you've got fever, the potentially the rash, not everybody gets that. Um, I know quite a few people who, 
used doxycycline just as the doctor prescribed and it worked very well for them. The issue that I had was that I was, um, I was already in kind of like a chronic stage by the time I realized I had Lyme, it was almost half a year or longer Mm. from the tick bite when I realized that it's most likely Lyme that's causing my symptoms. Mm. And so, um, and actually I, I made a bit of a mistake earlier. I said I was in perfect health. Not, I wasn't necessarily perfect health. I was dealing with some food sensitivities already. Um, I was dealing with like eczema and other stuff. And that's what really put me off antibiotics. Mm. I really didn't want to go that route because the doctor that I consulted with wanted to put me on two different antibiotics and I was supposed to be on them for, I think, six to eight weeks. And I was thinking, you know, if I'm already having so much difficulty with digestion, with just normal eating and, and, uh, and digestion habits, then this is really going to throw me off, you know? Mm. And so I, I, at the beginning, I said, there's no way I'm doing antibiotics. I'm going to figure out a way to do this naturally, which is looking back really wild to me. I can't believe that I made that commitment, but I think it was the sheer willpower and the, and the conviction that got me through that whole uh, ordeal. (laughs) Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Cause I've heard mixed things. Like I know some people in the Ray Pete, you know, quote community are pro antibiotics and they think they're, they're fine and useful. And there's probably a context, but that's, that's really interesting that you didn't go that route. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, I was just determined not to, not to do pharma, (laughs) not to let them decide what I would take. Yeah. That's awesome. You mentioned, uh, going dormant earlier and that's, that was curious to me because does that mean that if you get, say a bit by a deer tick, that's, that has this carrying line, um, you can not develop symptoms for years later. Does that happen to some people? Oh yeah. There's, um, I mean, there's regions in the country where a large majority of people or, or at least a substantial, uh, portion of the population has Lyme because there are deer ticks, but they simply don't have symptoms. Uh, I've, for some reason, Texas comes to mind, probably in the Western U.S. Uh, as well. I don't. I, I didn't specifically research this, but I do recall hearing a doctor speak about this um, on a podcast about Lyme. So one of the first things I did actually just fell into my lap, um, kind of in a providential way. I was suggested to uh, listen to the Lyme Summit. So this was in 2015. It must have been at that point, or. Um, summer of 2015, there was a Lyme summit that Dr. J. J. Davidson put on. And he's, um, I think the way he got into researching and healing people from Lyme or working with people who have Lyme was that his wife uh, had quite a severe case of it. Hmm. And so he got her out of it. um, And it totally changed his life because he was just, to my understanding, he was quite a normal what you would think of as a normal MD up until that point. And he really shifted to the naturopathic style of, of medicine after mm-hmm. his wife's ordeal. And um, so he started organizing these online events called summits for people to inform them about Lyme. And he had guests like Dr. Dietrich Klinghart and um, people who had gotten out of Lyme, chiropractors who worked with people with Lyme, all sorts of different mm-hmm. practitioners. And so I, uh, I think that's where I initially heard that pe- there were people who were who are infected with Lyme bacteria, but just because of the robust immune system that they have, uh, or maybe you know it's probably has a lot to do with environment, sun exposure, EMF, a lot of different things. They're asymptomatic; they're just able to handle it, right? Mm-hmm. And I um, very quickly re- recognized that there's probably a lot to that theory because the same thing happened to me up until the point where I suppressed my immune system. Mm-hmm with the corticosteroids, I probably would have, you know, maybe I would have become symptomatic five, 10, 15 years down the line. I don't know if that's possible because I think the body produces antibodies and it's able to control the bacteria. Um, but that's what, what resonated with me was the fact that I had this period of being asymptomatic and then everything coming up when, when I quieted down my immune system Mm -hmm. probably has a lot to do with vitamin D levels, fat soluble Mm -hmm. vitamin levels, things like that diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of other stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I've heard um, people that start to get Lyme symptoms, like it, it can kind of mimic a lot of other conditions. Like people just all of a sudden start getting joint pain or something. And that's what makes it kind of tricky. Right. If, if you don't notice that you were ever bitten by a tick, which, 
a lot of people don't. Um, but I want to ask you um, about the testing, like for Lyme, like, are there accurate tests? Because it seems like a lot of people think they might have Lyme, but they're not 100% sure. Or Yes. So there are accurate tests. And I think those are the ones that are probably least likely to be covered by insurance. Mm. Uh, so those are things that people need to do privately. I, I did know uh, the names of the, of the more top of the line tests, but I wouldn't be able to recall them at this point. This was also something I learned from that summit. Mm. Um, but I know that the Western blot is definitely not a accurate test. And I had the Western blot done I believe it was twice and um, it came out equivocal, meaning so it's like right in the middle, can't say yes, can't say no. So you can't really diagnose or rule out. Mm. And um, I was unfamiliar with the way insurance works. I was unfamiliar with like all the logistics of going to the doctor, getting these tests, ordering stuff. So I just thought uh, since I have all these symptoms, everything matches up. The deer tick bite was there. I'm just going to treat it like it's Lyme. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing that, things started improving because mm -hmm. up until that point, I was taking collagen. I was taking MSM for joint health mm -hmm. because I know uh, I recall reading about how corticosteroids can deplete a lot of nutrients, one of them being sulfur. Mm -hmm. And sulfur is really important for the tendons and the connective tissue mm -hmm. to build the bridges between different proteins. And so when you deplete the sulfur, those tissues become more, more brittle and more, mm. uh, more fragile. Right. So I, mm. I initially thought that if I take collagen, MSM, a few other things, mm. I'll probably get my joints back online, but that wasn't the case. Things kept mm. getting worse actually. Mm. So that's, uh, at that point I realized this is probably something that's actively fighting against my body inside my body. Right. And, um, mm. started looking at antimicrobial stuff, started really getting serious about taking vitamin C um, a lot of things I gathered through word of mouth through other people who had their own health journeys uh, and, or, or, or had uh, children who had some very serious health complications that they helped them get through. So one lady I know specifically mentioned zinc. And so I would just gather these facts and I would put them together and I started building the model of what health really is, how the body works. Because up until that point, you know, I didn't know the difference between a mineral and a vitamin. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the difference between a really like, I couldn't say what a carbohydrate or a protein was. I just knew these things are stuff we need to have inside of us in certain amounts, but I didn't know why, how much to take, when to take it and all that. But um, just with experimentation, reading and exposure to conversations with people who, who, who had walked the walk, I, uh, I was able to start building a protocol for myself that got me on more stable footing. Mm -hmm. But uh, what really changed the game for me were, were two things. It was uh, cannabis paste. Mm. So full spectrum cannabis paste really got me through the lowest period. Mm. Uh, at that point, I was just really at a loss for what to do. Things were just consistently getting worse. And mm. that the cannabis paste shifted everything completely. Mm. I started getting better. A lot, of the, a lot of the minor symptoms went away completely and never came back. Oh. I did have very very intense Herxheimer reactions, which I believe to be Herxheimer reactions because, you know, the, the shivering in bed, the, the, the absolutely dreadful anxiety, you know, in the darkness of your room while you're, while those bacteria are dying inside you. That's what I think was happening uh, when I took some pretty big doses of the cannabis paste. Does it kill them directly or? From what I know, yeah. Wow. THC, THC is directly bactericidal. Mm. Yeah. Wow. But I, you know, again, I, I need to really dig into the research to be able to say, exactly how but yeah i mean from my experience taking the cannabis paste as soon as it started kicking in uh the the um the the reactions would begin they got less and less intense over time and my symptoms really subsided my joints improved so you know a, a lot of this stuff comes from experience you're able to put the puzzle pieces together you know i did this this happened i did it again I, and and you, you track the the data that you collect, you see the patterns, you see the the, the different trends mm -hmm. in how symptoms react to different doses, and uh, and and you're able to be certain about these things, even though you don't know all the specifics of maybe what THC is doing mm -hmm. exactly, right? But cannabis paste was a big one. I actually put it away. Uh, I think I threw like half of a jar out of it because it scared me so badly. Mm -hmm. It was. <laughs> 
I mean, it, you know, cause it wasn't, it was full spectrum. So I had this, uh, I had all the, all the effects of it. Mm-hmm. So uh, there was a lot of psychological darkness to work through as well. Is that the same as Rick Simpson oil or is it different? Or- it's different. It's okay. uh, so the, the, the paste is just the actual bud ground up mm-hmm. and boiled at, I think 117 degrees Fahrenheit mm-hmm. in vegetable glycerin. Mm. And so you take that, you take a really tiny little amount mm. and you get all of the constituents of the cannabis. Rick Simpson oil, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the, um, with the constituents, with what it really, what it contains, but I know that I know, I know about it. I know people use it for cancer and all that. Mm. So the cannabis was one thing. And then the next thing was Dr. Lee Cowden's, uh, Cowden support program. So mm. that was a nine month protocol of herbal extracts. Mm. And it was quite an intense regimen. I was uh, really on a schedule when I was taking that stuff. It was mm. four times a day dosing, I think, between eight and 12 herbal tinctures mm. together. And so there was, I, they, it's really cool. They send, a, they send you this booklet with mm. the entire nine months printed out every single day. Mm. And it tells you, you know, uh, the, it's got four columns and it tells you what to take every day. And so it changes week to week and then it changes month to month. Mm. So, um, I, I, I went all in on that and it was, it was huge for me. I mean, that was the real, that was the real game changer for me was Mm. Dr. Lee Cotton's, uh, protocol. And I did all nine months of it. And the, the, the difference was drastic. I mean, I would, I've, when people ask me, I've had, you know, direct messages or, or friends of friends uh, ask me what to do because a loved one has Lyme or they have Lyme and it's chronic at this point. Um, they're having some serious symptoms. I always direct them or suggest to them to look into Dr. Lee Cobb's proto- protocol because that was the biggest, uh, the biggest effect for me came out of that. Wow. And everything else was supplementary. Everything else was like a support to that. Interesting. Lime Warrior? Is that? Uh oh. <laughs> it's taken out. Cowden Protocol. It's going to be the yeah. Nutramedics link. So oh, yeah, okay. it'll be the first one. Yep. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So there's, uh, and actually, this is the first time I encountered systemic enzymes because he has people taking serapeptase mm-hmm. along with all the herbs. Interesting. And so that's, that's when I learned about the biofilms and the fact that these bacteria not only have this antigenic variation not only are they able to form cysts and 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 burrow into cells and stuff like that but they also form biofilms hmm. and the serapeptase is there to break down those biofilms and let the body better attack the bacteria and hmm. let the herbal extracts do their their thing wow so is it um was it these herbs like uh, seeing like stevia tacuna <laughs> a lot of these i've never heard of sparga parsley yeah, I think a lot of these are kind of uh, <laughs> branded names for okay. different um, mm. for different herbs. Mm. Like I know the well, parsley is parsley, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the cilantro extract, but the the banderol, cemento. I think those are the heavy hitters. Cemento, mm. banderol, and berber. Mm. Those are the three that I recall uh, being being. They were the core of the pro- protocol, if I recall. Mm-hmm. Um, they were there all nine months, and I think those are several different herbal extracts in one bottle mm. yeah wow yeah so it looks it's a little bit investment like 350 a month. <laughs> is an investment. yeah 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 interesting yeah because it seems like you know with with covid or whatever else there's rarely like a magic bullet so people kind of have to experiment and find like kind of try different things right like to see i think some people have said you know they just I thought I heard some stories where just systemic enzymes help them tremendously with Lyme. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's entirely possible because the biofilms are one of the biggest problems uh, for the immune system to actually break down the bacteria. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, what you mentioned earlier about, about there not being a silver bullet and I completely agree. I mean, I think one of the main things that I learned through, through the Lyme, episode through healing from that was that you just have to start somewhere because what I was doing, there was a certain period where I was really doing nothing more than like drinking green tea, like really strong green tea for the anti-inflammatory action. 
um, and doing a few other things like taking really big doses of vitamin C and B, B complex. I think I was doing cold showers and cold baths at that time as well. But I had a few tools that were really working for me, but I wasn't sure what else to do because I was at the mental uh, level of, or, or the way I thought about it was that I need the answer and then I'll take the action. Mm. And that's a, that's a big mistake. I think what, what's really important is that you have to start somewhere. Mm. You have to just try one thing, try one herb. Uh, if it works, add on to it mm. and, and keep experimenting, obviously not in a way that endangers you in any way, but just with basic things like oregano, mm. uh, systemic enzymes, high doses of vitamin C, mm. uh, things like that, and uh, coconut oil as well big doses mm -hmm. of that can, can work wonders and then you start to learn about your body and learn how it reacts to these different compounds mm -hmm. and you're you, you're just gaining more and more experience and then because of that experience you have a better foundation for judging what might be the next best course of action right and that's how it worked for me i mean i was kind of stuck in place for a while and um and what happened was my brother uh booked me an appointment with this doctor uh, and he was the one who I spoke to about the double dose or double, double, uh, double barreled <laughs> antibiotic approach. And, uh, I, I had really high hopes for that appointment and I was speaking to him and he, he suggested these antibiotics. And I said to him that, uh, that I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that he's suggesting antibiotics. So I was really hoping for him mm -hmm. to suggest something else for me. Right. And that's when he told me about cotton protocol. He said, I understand that you don't want to do antibiotics. If you're not looking at that, you can, uh, you can look at cotton protocol. And that turned out to be the very thing I needed. So I think another important thing is that you have to be very frank with doctors mm -hmm. and, and, and you shouldn't really avoid them because this guy was an MD, right? Mm -hmm. He was not, so they're not the enemy. They're, mm -hmm. they're there. They have their schooling. I mean, I'm <laughs> God willing, I'll be an MD as well. And I, 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 I want to be, uh, I want to be there to help people along and, and find their path, but they're not always going to have all the answers, but they're there to guide people. And, mm -hmm. and, and you, ha and, and the patient really needs to put the doctor in a position of, I want you to give me more information. I want mm -hmm. to give, I want you to tell me what other alternatives there are. Don't just give me one option. Give me ABC so I can pick and I can look. Right. And that's what happened. I, I was, uh, you know, I was, I was disappointed, but I told him that. And thankfully a lot of good came out of that because I discovered this, this protocol that ended up being what I needed. So mm, that's awesome. Um, did you ever look into like devices or research or utilize any, cause I know some people say that was like a key part of their healing is like using Royal Rife machines. And, you know, I used to go to all sorts of conferences and you would strap these, you know, pads to your hands and then it runs in specific frequencies and, your hands are kind of vibrate and, you know, your blood circulates uh, pretty, pretty quick, you know, or there's like, you know, your extremities. So pretty much all your blood will pass through that current. Okay. Um, and I definitely felt some effects over the years with different Rife machines, but just curious if, uh, if you went down that rabbit hole ever during the yeah, as far as devices, uh, no, I, I never went down that path. But really, as far as I went was red light, but mm -hmm. that came a lot later. Mm -hmm. uh, I really wish I had done that earlier, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think it would have been financially feasible for me at that time. So everything came at the right time for me. Um, but red light, yeah, I've got the EMR Firestorm mm -hmm. and the uh, and the Fire Wave, and I love both of those. They've They've been instrumental in healing my knees that was incredible and we can I, I mentioned that to you earlier we could talk about that a little bit how i how i fixed that because that was my main symptom I, other than the digestive intolerances and all the inflammation and the fatigue and things like that the depression the knees were the first symptom and the, to appear and the last symptom to disappear and that was the hardest thing to take care of but uh yeah no other devices for me i did hear about the rife machines i heard about a few things but and maybe they would have helped me, but I didn't really resonate with that. I didn't, I didn't have easy access to those things. So I just kind of, uh, made a mental note of it and, and, and moved on. I was more really everything that helped me was something that I took internally, mm -hmm. vitamins, herbs, food, uh, and the external things were sunlight and cold water. Mm. 
this cold, mm-hmm. cold water. Yeah. Cold thermogenesis was one of the lifelines for me during the hardest times. It was just, you know, like getting up in the morning, uh, immediately right into the cold shower. And then as soon as I got home from school, right back into the cold shower and it was just kind of the rhythm of the day, <laughs> you know, I needed cold water to survive at that point. I was doing research, figuring things out. And then I took the next steps and built on that. Mm. Yeah. That's awesome. So that when you say the joint pain was like your longest lingering sy- symptom after the fatigue and brain fog, and all the other stuff. Yeah. So it uh, it started in one knee and then it moved to both. And then it mm-hmm. started going to the hips and the shoulders. And thankfully mm-hmm. it retreated from the shoulders and the hips with the cannabis based. Mm-hmm. And then the, the cotton protocol came soon after that. So that those uh, the, the shoulder and hip pain never came back, but the knees were lingering for quite a while. Um, and I still have, you know, a little bit of this and that just t- tingles and, 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 maybe a little bit of inflammation here and there, but I can do everything I want to do as long as I'm moderate about it. I don't have to severely limit myself, but I can squat um, very near my, my one rep max for reps. I can, uh, I can do sprints. I can hike, jump. So I've, I have full functionality. I just have to be careful about recovery, uh, things like that to make sure I'm, I'm not overusing them. But um yeah, that, that was definitely the most serious symptom. And it was really a marker of where I was because as my knees improved, so did my skin, so did my fatigue, so did my depression. Uh, I'm sure a lot of that was psychological, you know, because when you're young and you have serious joint issues, that's going to hit your, your psyche for sure. Uh, but yeah, taking care of the knees seems to be like, as long as that's getting better, then everything else is getting better as well because the bacteria hit the knees first they started i think they probably what they do is they i I know they um they digest the hyaluronic acid in the in the in the in the collagen matrix so they weaken the tendons in that way and i felt very unstable on my knees and as i progressed with all these different therapies that i was including and going from one to another and building upon the success uh the, the knees just kept getting better and then i had a protocol that I had a lot of help from a certain practitioner to design, including BPC, red light, and a few other things. And that was really what sealed the deal for me. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. It, it's fascinating because you think of people with like injuries, like um, knee injuries or back injuries, and you always just assume it's like sports injury, or like you, you know, you, you twisted wrong or you lifted something wrong, but I mean, I wonder how many cases of that um, are like dormant lying in these creatures that got in those areas. Like, for example, about a, I think it was a year and a half ago or so, I had like a freak back, um, like, like a pain would start at night and then, and then leave in the morning and then go again for like, I think a week straight. And it was so excruciating to where I almost wanted to cry. Like I could barely move at all wow and it came out of nowhere i didn't twist i didn't lift anything it was totally random and i'm just like either it was emotional spiritual or you know maybe a combination you know but a critter got my spine or something but i just remember being down and out for like a week and uh you know i i guess my system worked through whatever it was but it's just fascinating to think about that these uh is what bacteria can get in these nooks and crannies in your body. And just, I mean, like you said, the, the tendons, the, the hyaluronic acid, just get rid of that and right. cause mischief. So it's, it's wild. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I think uh, the majority of the, the sports injuries, I mean, like in basketball, you're always hearing, hearing about torn ACLs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of that, it just really boils down to not recovering properly, mm-hmm. not, you know, people involved in athletics are just usually very high energy and they constantly feel like they can do more and more. And I think the important part when you're at that point of having your health at the top level is actually forcing yourself to take a step back and not perform at a hundred percent constantly, because sooner or later, no matter how good your health is, you're going to pay for it one way or another. But yeah, I don't, I don't doubt at all that, uh, there's, there could be a role that uh, some kind of bacteria 
or dorm or, or underlying kind of silence inflammation is playing a role in all that. Uh, yeah. I mean, you have to, to get a real serious joint injury. It's, it's not a instance. I mean, of course it is an instant. It's a, it's a single event that happens, but you do have to build up to that unless it's like, you know, you're skiing and, and your ski goes completely 180 degrees around. But when you're, um, when you're playing sports and doing these cutting motions, your body is designed to be able to handle stresses like that. But when you're not recovering and you're using poor mechanics, that's the wear and tear makes those types of injuries more likely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, it just seems like it's as easy as going on a camping trip or a hike in the backwoods and, you know, most people like hiking. I think it's a small percentage that doesn't. I don't know, <laughs> but it just seems like such an easy thing to have happen. And not to, not to, you know, spread fear, but it's definitely inspiration to, you know, support your blood brain barrier, like you know you said earlier, and just overall health to uh, to have this resiliency, right? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, time spent in nature. Actually, that's a really good. <laughs> thanks for bringing that up because this is one of the biggest uh, biggest pieces of the recovery puzzle was understanding the EMF and the the importance of exposure. And it's so funny to say like exposure to nature. What do you mean exposure? I mean, we're just, we're exposed to EMFs. We're, we're dwelling in nature. We're, we're here and this is our natural state in, in the forest and without these cell towers surrounding us and, and all the Wi-Fi routers. But um, spending time in the backwoods, without any kind of telephone connection, no Wi-Fi routers. Uh, we would, we were fortunate enough to do that as a family every, every so often. Um, and during my time when I had Lyme and I noticed every single time, and I mean, without, without any exception, every time we were there, even if it was three days, so you know, two nights, we, we, we get there and we leave very quickly. I would notice improvement the minute I stepped out of the car mm-hmm. And I was not surrounded by these frequencies. I, I noticed just better well-being. My knees aren't as inflamed. I can do more before they start getting inflamed. And uh, that was compounded by the river, uh, swimming, you know, and, and, and hanging out in the lakes and, and walking through the forest barefoot and things like that. And I noticed that not only did I improve when I was there, but those improvements stayed with mm-hmm. me. So I would bring all my, all my herbs with me, my supplements, my, my teas and, and all the bactericidal stuff I was taking. And, uh, and I, I synergized the exposure, <laughs> the, the, the time spent in nature surrounded by forests and rivers with the protocols I was using. And that was where a lot of the best results I had came from mm-hmm. because uh, my body was just fighting against less stress, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm calmer and, and the body's better able to use the medicines that I'm providing it for dealing with the Lyme bacteria. And um, I think that showed me that, that convinced me, those little data points that I gathered from experience showed me that Jack Cruz knew what he was talking about. Not that I really ever doubted him, but you know, you always have the voice in the back of your head thinking like, is it really true? Is, is he really right about all these things? But the experience proved it to be correct. And although, although I wouldn't do some of the things, uh, I did, <laughs> I did back then when I was very, very, uh, gung-ho. very gung ho. Yeah. Very, very committed to the cruise way of life. That, funny enough, in spite of all the, the, I guess what, what I would call now mistakes, mm-hmm. my health was improving big time. And that, mm-hmm. that may be in some degree, just to the fact that I was taking, just because of the fact that I was taking control of my situation. And I think that has a huge impact on, on your ability, your motivation to recover. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm, I, don't, I don't doubt that the seafood played a role. I mean, seafood's got a lot of good stuff in it, mm-hmm. selenium and all the rest of the nutrients. I'm sure the, the, the polyunsaturated fats also play their role in, in lowering inflammation, although long-term they can, be, they can be problematic. But all of that ended up working really well for me. So I was... I was spending time in the forest, um, eating salmon with turmeric and black pepper and coconut oil for breakfast, going for a river swim, coming back, having green tea. And those, those days and those weeks piled up. And just as I tracked my progress, I could see that every time I, I spent a few nights in the woods, everything got better. And it didn't stay as good 
as it was when I was in the forest, but it made a significant improvement where it got me to a little bit of a level higher than before I came. So hmm. interesting. So when you like when you uh, I think you mentioned a river and uh, cold thermogenesis earlier, like what were your views on it back then, and what are your views on it now? Because um, I was funny. I was looking back at my old YouTube videos the other day. And I think I, I, I got the stock tank, you know, and filled it with ice yes. when I was living in the city. It was like, right. I don't know, six years ago now or something like that. It was quite a ways back. And now it seems like everybody's doing it. And there's at least four or five companies I know of that sells, you know, temperature regulated ice baths. You can just buy and just plug it in, assuming you're not off grid like me. <laughs> yeah. It takes a ton of power. Um, fortunately, you know, I have a body of water here. I could just jump in, but we were talking about it earlier before we started recording just, um, the idea of cold therapy and, um, like I just see people kind of overdoing it. And I, uh, you know, I wonder what's needed to get the effect because I used to do the booties and, you know, go in at solar new naked grounded in the ice bath. And usually like 55 to 57 Fahrenheit, I think my record was like 43 Fahrenheit. But um, it just seems like there's this like machismo, like willpower test yes. vibe right now. It's like more the better, longer the better, colder the better. You know, it just seems like more of a mental exercise to me that people are doing more than like a physical benefit. Because according to my friend Leo Wick that I had on the show, he's like in Russia, it's in and out. Like you go in the sauna get out of the sauna, you jump in the cold water, you get out, you go in the sauna. It's like, we're not sitting in there chanting ohm for 20 minutes, you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No, I, I totally agree with that type of a viewpoint. I think, first of all, the Russians know what they're doing when it comes to the cold, you know, they've, they've, uh, they've braved it for centuries. So they have the, they have the experience to know how, how to do it right. I think I overdid it, but before we go to that, I'll, I'll say I love cold thermogenesis. I love cold exposure. You know, we don't have to necessarily call it thermogenesis, just cold, cold, di you know, cold dipping, uh, swimming in cold rivers. It's just like this. It's, it's so na such a natural thing to do um, when it's especially when it's 90 out or, or 100 close to 100 right now, like it is in this region. Uh, it feels perfect i mean your body's just screaming for it and you get you get freezing cold you go out and then you feel the sun warming you up and it just feels like this incredible synergy of solar heat and the water cooling you down and you just know something good is happening because you can feel it right uh but for me it started out with cold showers just for a very pragmatic reason because i i was feeling the inflammation despite the fact that I didn't have neurological symptoms, I didn't have any issues with like motor control or tics or any kind of stuff like that. I did feel anxiety, depression, just because of the inflammation I was dealing with that the bacteria was causing. And one of the best ways to take care of that was to get under the cold shower, turn it all the way to the, turn the knob all the way left and stand there for 10 minutes, you know, and just hit every body part until it was cold. And sometimes I would get to the point where I would, I would get out and I would be shivering for 10, 15 minutes, but it just felt so right at that point. And it worked for me for about two years. I, I, um, I wish I had pumped the brakes a little bit, but it worked really well. It synergized very well with all the things I was doing. So with, with the whole daily schedule that I had with the herbs and the teas and the, and the, and the foods that I was using and all the vitamins and everything else. And what ended up happening was once I got my knees back to where I wanted them to be, I, it was like, I no longer have the problem, but I still have tools. Mm. So I might as well just keep using them. Right. So I kept mm. pumping the green tea, three mugs a day, kept using the cold, cold, uh, cold exposure. So cold baths, cold showers. Um, I dropped all the carbs from my diet because actually this is, something that was also a big issue for me that I, during the time that I had the Lyme symptoms, one of the most difficult dietary challenges was not only the fact that I became sensitive to eggs, grains, um, and dairy, but also the fact that I couldn't really tolerate many carbohydrates. Mm. So I just, when I heard about low carb, no carb, when I heard about carnivore, that was, 
that was it for me. I'm like, mm-hmm. this is perfect. Right. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have the wisdom at the time to realize that this can only be a stepping stone. This can't be a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I kept doing those things and eventually it got me to the point that despite the fact that I had got, uh, gotten rid of the main symptoms of Lyme disease, I ended up crashing on the low carb diet. And that's mm-hmm. where thankfully I was working with a practitioner or I I ended up having to work with a practitioner because I was kind of at a loss for what to do because I had all, all these things that worked for me for for the past three, four years. Now they were no longer adequate to deal with the problem that I was dealing with because those tools actually created that problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So I can't, I can't use the same ones. I need a different set. So I decided to humble myself because I was, I think looking back very, 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 uh, I put a lot more trust in myself than I should have, but thankfully, in spite of all the mistakes I made, I, I took control of my health and I healed. But I, at that point, I decided I have to humble myself. I have to work with somebody smarter than me. So I got a gene gene scan done. I got a whole uh, whole battery of lab tests done. I pinpointed the fact that I had high reverse T3, meaning I had inflammation going on somewhere. So I started using Forskolin. Um, and but the, the main thing in the beginning was that this practitioner told me that I need to reintroduce carbohydrates into my diet. Mm. And I had no idea how to do that. I told you earlier, mm. I, you know, I, I, I had a bag of frozen vegetables and this is, I'm thinking carbohydrates. All right, well, here we go. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to thaw these vegetables out and I'll, I guess, cook them in butter and eat them. And it was so weird after two years of not eating that type of, of, of food. And then I encountered your posts on honey, royal jelly, mm orange juice. And that was what made it click for me. And at that point, I, 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 uh, I started investigating Ray Pete's ideas, started listening to um, Georgie Dinkoff's podcasts and your podcasts. Uh, I got all the books that, that the community that revolves around Ray Pete recommends. So How to Heal Your Metabolism was a very big one for me that I recommend to really anyone looking into uh, improving their health or preventing disease, you know, whatever it is, preventing aging. And that's, yeah, that's where, that's where I had to go on a whole different journey and realize, and, and what, what made everything click for me was a gut protocol, because as I mentioned, carbohydrates were very difficult for me to tolerate. So like I had eczema and eating broccoli, eating cauliflower, eating, you know, sometimes even honey would make the the skin issues flare up, but the royal jelly, for example, didn't. The mm. orange juice didn't. And um, mm. and this practitioner, thankfully, he got me to the point where I was fully able to tolerate carbohydrates again in all forms, mm. other than the the grain and and, and stuff like that, because um, we used things like uh, plant tannins, oregano, combined with BPC, um, some probiotics, as well as. Uh, Saccharomyces boulardii, the probiotic yeast. Mm-hmm. And there was a few other things, uva ursi as well, mm. really good antimicrobial herb. And I did that for, I believe it was a full four weeks. And it was really like a snap of a finger. I wow. went one, one day, you know, I'm not able to really tolerate vegetables and fruits. And I can feel pretty much as I'm eating them that my skin is starting to flare up. It was crazy. Wow to the point one month later where I'm enjoying all these things in huge quantities and I'm feeling this sense of relaxation come over me every time I have a meal with, you know, animal protein, vegetables and, uh, orange juice, and then a little bit of honey or royal jelly or whatever after that. Mm. Um, and goat kefir as well. I was able to Mm. use that as well during that time. And I felt the stress melting away. And I feel like really what it was, was maximizing or actually restoring glycogen storage ability, right? Mm. So glycogen is what your liver and your muscles use to store energy. Mm. It's linked glucose molecules, just for those who don't know, mm. um, lo- linked glucose molecules that your liver accumulates to be able to sustain you through the night, through any periods of fasting between meals and things like that. And for me, it was like, a total, it was as if I lost that ability completely. I would eat and then I wouldn't really get hungry. It's just that like an hour or two hours after the meal, I would just start to feel jitters and anxiety. It's a, you know, it's like, if you think of Pavlov's dogs, it's not a really good thing for your mind to associate with eating. Like 
I'm, I'm starting to shake. I'm feeling anxious. Let me go eat despite the fact that I have no appetite. But I knew after all the podcasts with Ray and, and the information you were putting out and what George Dinkoff was saying, I knew I just had to barrel through that, eat three meals a day, despite the anxiety. Just, it was almost, I hate to use the worst word force feeding, but it kind of was like force feeding in the, in the sense that I had to put a meal in front of myself and I had to finish it no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that three times a day and I had to do that until I recovered. And mm -hmm. that was like a two year journey in and of itself to really gain the, the normal kind of baseline state. Um, mm -hmm. I really, I could have done a lot more. I was very busy during that time. So mm -hmm. it could have been a much shorter ordeal, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it took that long for me just because of all the other things going on in life. You know, at that point I was studying for an entrance exam, working a full-time job and taking classes. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so that'll, that'll, that'll stress your system, you know, but thankfully it all worked out in the end. And then, uh, yeah. You, you mentioned so like you said, liver glycogen and, and just glycogen storage because there's liver and muscle, right. And like lately I've been, uh, really fascinated with like the walking after a meal like my friend tyler you know got me into that and uh john the savage uh, was a really big fan of that i've just been kind of meditating on it and researching it and implementing it which just sounds so basic you know just walking after you eat but um that seems to be, be doing a lot for me for that effect you were just talking about with the feeling shaky or unstable you know, going too long in between meals, yeah. which with how busy my schedule is right now, that's like invaluable to like stabilize as much as I can, just in case there's a huge period in between meals, which it's just going to happen because life and right. all the stuff, you know, I'm juggling. But uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like there was a, there was research that showed that um, just walking for 10 minutes after a meal is twice as effective as the, diabetes drug metformin <laughs> for like stabilizing blood sugar yeah and i guess what it does is it, it just um almost without insulin like it puts glucose from the from the blood into the muscle and it's like the timing is after the meal and uh you know it's not just for digestion i'm noticing like a nervous system effect from walking after eat. it's really pretty cool yeah it's funny how we're rediscovering that the natural way of life is the healthiest way, right? I mean, people used to sit down for a meal on the homestead, you know, eat their, eat their, uh, whatever it was, their, their pork chops and their mashed potatoes, and have a glass of kefir, and then they would go right back to work. And so they're, they're physically active as soon as they fuel up, they're back to using their muscles and moving around. Whereas for us, unfortunately, it's like we eat and then we sit back down at our desk and try to, you know, push through another chapter of our textbook or do some work on the computer. And yeah, it's without a doubt, it, it makes a huge difference. That's, that was one of the things I implemented as well. Uh, I didn't do that after every meal, but I did that after breakfast. Mm -hmm. Every day I would walk the dog and that was uh, just a, a big mental improvement of not like going from the house where you just had a meal straight to the car and now you're sitting in the mm -hmm. car driving to work, but walking the dog first, doing a little mm -hmm. physical activity it definitely, definitely affects blood sugar very positively. And, um, I know we, we mentioned taurine earlier as well. Mm -hmm. Taurine is another good one for restoring glycogen, glycogen storage capacity. Actually, John the Savage, is the one who turned me onto that. Mm -hmm. And Georgie has a quite extensive post on the Ray Pete forum about taurine as well. I think it's uh, five grams daily for men raises testosterone quite a bit. It increases insulin sensitivity hmm. and it uh, can increase glycogen storage capacity by up to two times. Wow. wow. And, you know, if you think about all those benefits combined, that's such a potent de-stressor because yeah. everybody's always thinking, well, I don't want to make a statement like that, that broad, but we tend to think when we think of uh, getting rid of stress, we go toward things like ashwagandha or some kind of herb. I need an additional healthy. Yeah, yeah. I need, I need something to, to bring down the, the stress and those things definitely work, but often just optimizing the, the basic physiological processes, getting a little bit more salt, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, really starting with the basics. Like if you open a physiology textbook, you're going to learn about sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium mm -hmm. as the basic electrolytes. 
You're going to learn about glycogen, um, blood glucose, those basic things. And just addressing those really basic physiological realities can get you probably 50% of the way wherever you're going, depending on what you're dealing with, right? But uh, those are the things that <laughs> yeah. very high yield, very low cost, right? Which is what we're all looking for to get the maximum benefit with the least amount of effort and cost. Yeah. That's, that's a good point about the minerals. Um, the sodium and potassium thing is interesting because for years I was all about magnesium, magnesium, magnesium. That's the missing piece for everyone. But then you realize that, you know, if you're deficient in uh, potassium and sodium, there's even like a boron connection. It's not just right. magnesium. There's all these things surrounding being able to like store magnesium, utilize it. And uh, what's fascinating is, is uh, our potassium needs. I don't know how deep you've looked into that, but uh, you know, some people say we need four to 5,000 milligrams a day, which sounds like difficult to get unless you're supplementing nowadays. Right. And then, um, you know, less sodium. So it's like, we need, was it double the potassium to sodium every day? But most people have that like flipped, right. They're barely getting any potassium. They're getting right. tons of sodium. Yeah. And I think that's one of the main reasons that the salt and high blood pressure myth was mm -hmm. so easily accepted because it is, I mean, it's true, mm -hmm. but it's true in a context that isn't addressed. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're potassium deficient and you're eating a high salt diet, then your blood pressure will rise just because of basic, you know, os osmotic, uh, the osmotic principle, you're more solute, more, more solutions going to get pulled in. So you're, you're holding water and your body's going to retain it and raise blood pressure. Right. But then there's the whole missing piece of the fact that we're potassium deficient, we're magnesium deficient. And so the salt that we're taking in normally wouldn't be causing the rise in blood pressure that it, that it is if those minerals were balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, I think potassium is big. I just, I mentioned to you that I, I am trying to get my parents to be taking it <laughs> the daily. I think as people get older and start dealing with high blood pressure, I think potassium is a supplement that really makes sense for sure. Did you ever try like cream tartar? Like I tried, I tried potassium bicarbonate and gave me like blue stools, which, you know, it's easy to buy potassium bicarbonate powder or capsules. And then I switched to potassium chloride, I think. That was like, okay, but I seem to respond the best to potassium citrate, interestingly enough, uh, which I was kind of, you know, for a while, like questioning the citrate, but I feel definitely the best on it. I don't have to take a ton. It's just, you know, a couple capsules of potassium citrate in between meals every once in a while. But I know people used was like coconut water or a cream of tartar, like the two big sources. Yeah, I've, I haven't tried cream of tartar. I did. I, I do often uh, use coconut water i do have potassium chloride that i ordered and and i was using um but i didn't use it long enough to be able to really notice any kind of benefits mm -hmm. i have spoken to uh pedro mm -hmm. and he, he used the citrate as well so i'm gonna look into it i just started experimenting experimenting with potassium mm -hmm. uh and yeah i think it's a, a big key because it can really provide a lot of rest a lot of ability to just unwind, lower blood pressure, relax muscles, avoid, you know, spasms and, and, and little, little, uh, twitches in the muscles, things like that, that are showing you that you probably are missing some type of mineral, uh, in one area or another. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever, uh, look into boron or take that? Or yes. <laughs> no, boron, boron is good stuff. So I started with, uh, I started with borax and I had a little jar that I, I, I followed, there was this website that I can't find. I, I tried looking for it recently, um, but it had all the instructions of how to make, how to, how to dissolve the borax in the appropriate con concentration mm -hmm. to the water. And so I followed all the instructions and I had this big jar of dissolved borax on my desk and I would take a, a sip of it a day. And again, I mean, it's not placebo when you are literally, your abilities are, are, are getting better, right? When your, your knees used to hurt when you would walk on the sidewalk or especially when you walk upstairs or downstairs, you felt all, I felt all these different tinges. And, and even when I would stand in one place for extended periods of time, I would feel like, like my femur was almost not balancing on my tibia properly, mm -hmm. right? There's some kind of like 
lack of tension in the, in the tendons or the ligaments that was causing this weird feeling of instability. And then I'm doing collagen, I'm doing zinc, I'm doing vitamin C, green tea, cold exposure. And then I had boron and I added trace minerals. And again, my, my abilities are, are increasing. So I'm able to do deep squats, for example, for a certain amount of time without having an, a, a reaction where my knees get inflamed, or I'm able to go for a run 15 minutes and I come home and I don't have the redness and the swelling that I used to have a few months ago. So mm. I did do boron and I still, I still take it. Yeah. I, I go, I stay around six milligrams a day. Mm. Um, I'm not always on it. I don't think there's a need to be, but I I've heard that there is a village in Bulgaria where the men are conceiving children at in their late sixties and early seventies because the mineral, uh, the, the, the spring in the near the village has a high concentration of boron. Wow. <laughs> so wow. it's a huge mineral for fertility. Uh, I know it's a pro-androgenic mineral as well. I think it has some effect on estrogen as well. But um, yeah, it, it, I recall seeing something about boron being the, the mineral that actually helps retain magnesium and I guess probably potassium and, and other minerals as well. So different minerals have different roles and, and they even complement each other or enhance each other mm. in their activity. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's awesome. I, I think I saw you did a post on um, different magnesiums and I used to be like, Oh, homemade magnesium bicarbonate's the best, but I opened up to, you know, trying different forms and I don't think you need all the forms because that's like a marketing tactic right now is to say you need all, you know, you take these seven forms to get the best absorption or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a big debate. I mean, because you have three and eight, which some people say is the best form because it's the only one that crosses the blood brain barrier, which to me is not true. You know, it's patented. It's kind of a lot of marketing. It's not bad. It's just a more expensive form. Then you have like malate, let's say glycinate, magnesium torate, tornate, sometimes it's called. My view kind of is just like people probably want to avoid like carbonate oxide, right? So those are just right. kind of ineffective. Yeah, they're kind of like rock, right? <laughs> From my, to, to my understanding at least. But mm -hmm. I think I find it, I mean, I think what would answer that question would, would be to figure out in what way did we used to get magnesium in our diet, right? Mm -hmm. How 100 years ago, 200 years ago, how were people getting magnesium? And that would really be the answer to the question because if it's, ionic in the water and bound to some amino acid in the food well then you've answered the question right get get yourself an ionic magnesium for your water and maybe take a bis, uh the bisglycinate is the one that i take um or the and i do take three and eight as well i do i do like it i do find that it has a good effect on on my nervous system so it it may be that it preferentially gets into the the brain and the cns um but i do i do think when it comes to important things like magnesium, where the, the, the potential reward is so high, it makes sense to cover your bases and try a few different forms mm -hmm. and make sure that you're using things that you know you respond to. Mm -hmm. Because there are forms that, like, I don't, I don't think I need malate because I don't have muscle tension. Mm -hmm. I don't feel really any kind of, like, I don't have, I never dealt with fibromyalgia, things like that. But people who have could definitely benefit from malate. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me personally, I like the, the glycinate or the bisglycinate. I like three and eight and I like ionic because it just makes the ionic form makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I haven't, uh, admittedly, I haven't tried the, the bicarbonate that you promoted, mm -hmm. but I, I definitely would be interested in giving that a try. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I'm limited on the equipment and the options <laughs> I have right now to <laughs> experiment and the time and all that, but I, I can't wait to start experimenting again. Cause I really look back on the period of time. It was like, 2016, 2017, that was the time when I was doing a lot of experimenting. And it just seemed that like I had the Midas touch, you know, everything I touched turned to gold. I, I was just doing everything right. And I got really, really uh, proud of myself for a period of time. And I think that's the low carb crash was a reality check for me. And I, I'd love to go back to being able to do everything right for a period of time again. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's in the future uh, for me and hopefully for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever get into like the Epsom salt baths, magnesium baths? Definitely. Yeah. That was, uh, I didn't do that consistently, but every time I did, I felt a lot of improvement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I slept really well after that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think I've heard for Lyme people, that's really helpful. 
you get the the sulfur compound, which may or not be helpful. I think it's it's helpful for a lot of different things, but I prefer the magnesium chloride when I can. I feel that a lot more uh, topically, like in a bath. Okay, but um, that's awesome. Well, um, yeah. What else? <laughs> Is there anything else you wanted to chat about? I guess I want to ask you about um, like training. Like I just had John the Savage on. And do you kind of share his, uh, you know, training philosophy and uh, using kettlebells and stuff like that? <laughs> Yeah, so I I don't have much experience with kettlebells as some kind of a daily or, or not a, with every training session using kettlebells. I do, I did use them to warm up. I think they're great for dynamic warm ups and for really lighting up certain muscle groups, like with swings, lighting up the glutes uh, before deadlifts or squats, things like that. Uh, but I do I do think John's philosophy makes a lot of sense. I also encountered Mike Menster's work. Mm. And Mike Menser was a bodybuilder who was very much into finding the maximum possible reward in the form of muscle growth and strength with the minimal amount of effort or actually that's not the, not minimum effort, rather minimum time mm-hmm. commitment, right? So uh, I've really struggled with staying too long in the gym. I just love being there. It's like a time when you can think about nothing else and just kind of get out of your mind and into your body. So for me, it's a real sacrifice and, a, and an exercise and discipline to tell myself, no, I'm, I'm here for an hour. And when that, when that, when, you know, when it goes from 59 to zero, zero, I'm out of here. Uh, I'm always like one more thing, one more thing, one more stretch, one more lift. And, and, uh, and I end up being there for two and a half hours. Um, but I think, yeah, really be breaking it all down to the bare necessities, especially once you're past 25 years of age and you're constantly busy or if you have kids or a career or you're juggling multiple ventures uh, that's what needs to what needs to be done because there's no way to manage a life where you're busy and you're in the gym for two plus hours however many times a week uh, and I really liked what John said I was just listening to his podcast about how the the, the main benefits from exercise come in the first few like 10, 15, 20 minutes up to the first half hour. And then everything after that is just a cherry on top. And then once you get past a certain point, it's pretty much detrimental Mm -hmm. to, to a lot of, to, you know, your physiology or to just your ability to recover or your mental, um, your mental stability, because you're, you, you, you just enjoyed this long period of time in the gym, but now you've got to rush home. You've got to rush through this project or really quickly scarf down a meal to make up for the time you spent in the gym. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you're also in, for some people you're risking, you know, impacting your sleep as well. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What, what are your thoughts on like the opening up a can of worms here, but the biomechanics movement, because that's a really heated thing is there's some people that say, you know, deadlifts will destroy your health, you know, by, you know, they're not a functional movement or whatever. And I think John's perspective on that was like, it's so, uh, like you need so much training to get to that point that it's not really that practical. And I talked to him about it for like after the show or something that you need to work with a trainer and take these classes. Whereas with a kettlebell or some of these other things, you can really just jump right in. I mean, some people would argue that, right. You need to get the form down perfectly and all these things. But um, what are your thoughts on, on that general? (laughs) Well, yeah. So my, just to give some context, my experience with, with lifting is, uh, I had a pretty intense period where I gained a lot of muscle. Um, I'm sitting at just around 175 body weight right now. And I, at that point in time before Lyme and everything, I was around 190, 195, I think was my max weight. And so I was really satisfied with my, <laughs> my physique and my strength at that point. And I was, I was really hoping to keep going. And then I started having these knee problems. So mm. that was very uh, difficult to accept the fact that I really had to put lifting on the back burner for a quite, a, quite a while. Mm. But um, I did have a lot of success with lifting. And I'm, I've, after my recovery, I've tried to incorporate it as much as I can but it's been difficult just because of the changes in my life, studying for an entrance exam, getting into medical school, all that stuff. But I think that 
you're right. I mean, it is a can of worms because there are people with kinesiology degrees or physical therapists. So who am I to really comment on this? This is my field. But from experience, I think compound lifts are absolutely safe. I think the assumption is when, when people talk about the danger of heavy compound lifting, the, the kind of unspoken assumption is that you're constantly going very heavy. You're constantly maxing out or going, uh, you're lifting at low reps, but that doesn't really need to be the case at all. When I was making a lot of gains in my strength, I was lifting heavy, maybe once a week doing heavy deadlifts. And then the second time I did let deadlifts after that, and whether it was in the same week or the next week, I could do more of a bodybuilding style workout. So go reach up to 12, uh, 12 reps or try a different variation like deficits mm. to work a different muscle group, work on, uh, work on weak points, things like that. And it also really, really depends on your goals because I was never, I, I somehow never felt the urge to compete. I just had some numbers in my head that I wanted to attain and I didn't have a deadline in my head as to when I wanted to hit those numbers. And I was co comfortable with that type of an approach to lifting. Mm. I think the danger probably comes in to people, comes in, when people are on a schedule and they have a program and they're, they need to hit this number on this day and they need to hit this total by the time that they're, uh, they're, they're going into their powerlifting meet or their, whatever it is. And that's the, that's the point where you might be pushing your body too far. So for me, it was like, I was always really set on recovering and, and giving my body the time to regain strength before I hit the next heavy session. And I never had any type of injuries from lifting i was always very focused on form and i think i think for anybody who wants to get into lifting or any type of training at all being very aware of biomechanics and spending some time researching that on youtube and with the movement community it almost doesn't matter who you look at because they agree on the fundamentals for the you know how to move in different moving patterns for for a deadlift for a squat for whatever it is when you're running when you're sprinting and if you build that awareness and, uh, and you integrate it into your training, there's no reason why you're risking injury at that point, as long mm -hmm. as you're smart and you're giving yourself time to recover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I talked to, to John about, uh, we call it farmer's strength. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, cause I'm not a fan of the gym. Like I, I commend you. I think that's awesome. That you <laughs> you want to stay in the gym longer. I just, I used to go to it with my friends and it would be kind of cool. And I got a little bit into it, but now just with like pushing the wheelbarrow or stacking bales of my alfalfa and grass for the goats, or I don't know, just all the little things that I have to do here, carrying water or whatever. Um, I would like that to be the only thing, but I do feel better integrating just a kettlebell, which I'm doing thanks to John. So, yeah. yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, the, the, the kind of strength that comes from, the daily life activities is the best type. Uh, I think adding on to that with a kettlebell or some actual intentional exercise is probably a great way to relieve stress. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I always loved, I, I, my main love in terms of exercise was outdoor calisthenics in the sun, in the heat. I don't know. That was just for me. I love to be sweaty <laughs> out in the sun and, and, um, sprinting, doing pull-ups, doing like squat jumps and things like that. Um, the gym came after that for me and I, I never really spent more than, uh, a few months at a time being consistent with the gym, even though that was, I was seeing a lot of benefits, just life pushed me in different directions. But yeah, ideally, I mean, work plus a little bit of calisthenics, a little bit of running, some sprinting. I think that really is all you need. And a martial art for those who like to uh, gain those abilities, that should be more than enough. You know? Yeah. And, and some firearms, right? Now I'm going to get kicked off here. <laughs> it's getting weird with that right now. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And I, I think I kind of skipped over because you made an interesting point about the low carb thing and why you crashed. And, um, you were saying, you know, the carnivore thing, we were talking about that earlier, just, you know, eating mostly uh, muscle meats, organ meats, that can help a lot of people. Um, 
do you think that's why the carnivore diet is so popular right now? It's just because people have this intolerance to, like you said, grains, you know, eggs, dairy, beans, nuts, seeds. I mean, it seems like we're in a time where like people are allergic to so many different food groups. And I wonder how much of that is psychological, right? Because you have like Gundry, and you have the lectins and the phytates and the, all the plant anti-nutrients, which I think they're beneficial in context. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I remember a, uh, an exchange I had with somebody when I was hardcore carnivore, my handle was still Johnny carnivore, Johnny carnivore on Instagram. Uh, and I was, I was really serious about it following Baker really parroting, you know, what he was saying. And, and I, I give myself uh, a lot of understanding and, and, and I look back and I kind of smile when I think of myself back then, because I was really doing the best I could. And it really helped me. I, I made a lot of improvement in my health. I paid the price for it eventually. But thankfully, the joint benefits and a lot of other things ended up sticking with me. Um, but I do, like I said, I recall this exchange with somebody who was challenging me on the things I was posting. And he was sending me studies about how oxalates have some kind of anti-cancer effect. Lectins have some kind of protective effect. because, And I think a lot of it has to do with the, the hormesis, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you're, you're exposed to something that's a little bit of an irritant. And the reaction that your body mounts to that compound is very beneficial. So it's the same thing with UV. It's the same thing with, uh, with lectins and oxalates and, and potentially a lot of other compounds in foods that we normally ate historically as humans. But nowadays, yeah, it's hard to say exactly why people are dealing with these intolerances. I mean, I ask myself that question every day because I'm dealing with that stuff and it really restricts what I'm able to eat. It really makes my diet very, very difficult to make, uh, diverse and, and, uh, and satisfying, but thankfully there's a lot that I'm able to eat. I'm, I'm not by any means deprived or malnourished, <laughs> but I think, um, it's just context. It always comes back to context and people with a history of gut problems are not going to gain the benefits of oxalate exposure of their, of their, you know, intestinal cells being exposed to a little bit of oxalate or a little bit of lectin because of the stress that those cells are under, because of the thinning of that mucosal barrier, those compounds are probably purely negative for them. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're not gaining the benefits of the oxalates. They're just having a reaction to them and it's coming out on their skin. It's causing bad bowel movements. It's causing some kind of bacterial overgrowth, whatever it may be. And I, I think we're yet to find the reason for that. There's probably, you know, we, we, we all know what the major suspects are. But uh, hopefully we'll be able to pinpoint that in the future, you know, however that comes about, whether it's through independent researchers like you, medical, medical research, you know, that's funded by whoever. <laughs> hopefully it all comes together and we, we gain a better understanding of, of what's going on, because th this really is a weird time. If you think about it, you know, people just used to be able to eat and they never had to think about all these weird intolerances. Yeah. Yeah. Even like the, the gluten thing with. Uh with spaghetti <laughs> I've been seeing that just the last few days. And it's so interesting. Like some people have a few that, you know, it's in grains inherently that are indigestible for most, most humans because of genetics or whatever. And then there's other people that say it's just the glyphosate that makes right. the, the grains intolerable for people. And I think there's one brand my friend um, sent me that's glyphosate free spaghetti i just haven't been able to, to find it to buy it but i feel pretty good i mean i'm i'm italian and so i really enjoy my pasta you know and throw some ground beef in there and you know maybe say take some digestive enzymes but it makes me feel great so yeah no doubt i mean bread is bread is kind of this archetypal human food right we we take what the land provides we process it we bake it and we eat it and it's just not being able to eat bread is a very, very suspicious symptom to me. You know, why, why would we not be able to eat the very thing that's kind of the, the, the food that's most associated with the human diet, right? Um, but I, I think uh, it's just, it, it comes down to toxin exposure. And actually, recently, I was um, investigating, well, I had some conversations about this and 
it's most likely due to exposure to certain proteins while in a stress state where the either there's mm -hmm. some barrier compromise in the gut leading to uh or in addition to probably some kind of immune cell hypersensitivity and then these pro these undigested proteins due to the stress and the lack of digestive fluids mm -hmm. they're passing through the gut and into the bloodstream mm -hmm. and then these sensitized immune cells react with the mm -hmm. antigenic portions of the proteins and that's very likely how it happens and there's probably you know levels to the detail that we could go into but but in analyzing my own experience that really makes sense to me now the question to me is can it be reversed and mm -hmm. i feel like there's no reason it shouldn't be but i'm that's that's going to be have that's going to have to be a topic that i'm going to go really deep into researching very systematically in the future because i would love to be able to say i reverse these food sensitivities yeah. <laughs> that you know plagued me for so many years yeah yeah that, that'd be great yeah on the show recently we've been talking about allergies quite a bit and you know there's that uh diamine oxidase enzyme dao and what's interesting is it actually requires ascorbic acid zinc and copper um or i used to think it was only copper but you ne definitely need zinc you definitely need ascorbic acid for that enzyme to function and uh, there's also like histidine, you know, to make histamine. Right. And some people have like a desiccated kidney, uh, previous guest said, Andrew on the show, um, which contains the DAO enzyme, histidine, I think, and copper and zinc. So it kind of has everything to one. Right. But uh, yeah, food allergies are, are, are fascinating, just that intolerance. Um, but uh, yeah, this has been fun. I uh, appreciate you coming on. And I wanted to ask you, like, are you doing consultation right now or do you plan to, or what's, what's kind of, uh, are you, are you finishing, you're working through school still, right? Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'm, I, I had an undergraduate education here in the States and then I, uh, I worked for a few years in, in the health field. And after that, I had a few experiences that pushed me out of the path of getting into medical school in Europe. So I just finished my second year of the medical program there. I have four years left because mm -hmm. the European Union, I think actually it makes a lot of sense. They, 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 uh, they think that six years is the minimum for a proper medical education. Mm -hmm. So that'll give me a lot of time to really gain an understanding of what I want to do. I want to end up, I think ideally at this point, what I'm thinking of is private practice endocrinology mm -hmm. would, be, would be ideal for me. I think I'd love doing that. But we'll see because four years is a lot of time and I'm still going to have a lot of clinical experience in the meantime. I do consultations uh, through my structured metabolics mm -hmm. channel. Um, that's a that's a prototype for the private practice that I'd like to eventually have up and running mm -hmm. however many years from now in the future. Um, I haven't done very much at this point because of everything that's been going on, applying studying getting in first two years of pretty much boot camp just with my head in the textbook almost the entire time uh, but i i would like to increase the amount of console time that i spend with clients and that as uh as school becomes less of a primary concern so if anybody would like to reach me i do uh i i they can reach me by direct message on either the johnny omnivore handle on instagram or the structured metabolics uh, accounts and it's very much appreciated. Yeah. Is it nutrition and, and physical training coaching or what, what um, kind of coaching do you offer? So, yeah, I, I try to keep it simple at this point because despite my own vast experience with like four or five years of dealing with all these issues, bringing me into researching and dealing with things I never thought I would have to deal with. Mm -hmm. I still, that's all experience that re refers to me. It's all my experience, my body, my individual journey. So, I think um, I'm, I'm, I try to be realistic about what I can provide to clients mm. because of how much of that is personal. But at the same time, I am learning a lot uh, through my education, through the program mm. I'm going through right now. So the amount that I'm, the value that I'm able to provide to people when they consult with me is increasing year after year. But yeah, it's nutrition, lifestyle, sleep, exercise. It's all things that I think are, uh, are very, very basic. Mm -hmm. and and very uh very rewarding when when 
uh, addressed properly. And, you know, it's nothing crazy, nothing. Uh, I'm not looking at genes just yet. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I can do some basic lab interpretations, but I try not to delve into that because I'm nowhere near being fully licensed and all that, but I can help guide people, give them some information. Mm. So all the consults are informational and meant to guide people in the right direction and help them understand what's going on. Mm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, I realized like a lot of people um, can't learn and progress just from reading posts online. I mean, that's what I did um, is I just experimented and trial and error but it definitely takes a lot longer. And I find, you know, working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, um, like I used to do years ago, you find out certain things about uh, their house and, you know, where their bed's facing or what their bed's next to, you know, or you know, if it's right next to an outlet or <laughs> um, there's so many little details that you don't know. Like, like, you know, people reach out to you, I'm sure. I have X, Y, Z condition. What do you recommend? What supplement? You know, yeah, I'm like, right. Sometimes it could help, but we're really just, I mean, it's really just a shotgun approach. Like it might hit or it might not, but to really get a direct result, like you really need to know their EMF environment, you know, their light environment, which are one of the same, their water situation, drinking and bathing. Are they in a house, apartments, you know, they living in a tent. I mean, there's just so many, there's a million variables. Right. You really don't know. So you talk with someone one-on-one. -on -one. So I think it's really cool that you're doing that. Cause that's, that's a way to directly help people. Yeah. I mean, the main thing is when you're in that type of a situation where you, uh, where there's a person who doesn't know really anything much about health. I mean, really to even understand things like macronutrients, like, like proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, how they're broken down, how they're absorbed, what they do, you really need to take a full class mm -hmm. um, a, or at least be exposed to that type of stuff and read a, read a book. It's, it's not something that you can just understand based on a post or whatever. So a lot of people are interested in alternative health or, or at least approaching whatever issues they're, they're dealing with in a holistic way, but they don't even know what to think about. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the good that we can do people in our position where people are reaching out to us for consults or for information is just helping them to understand what they should be thinking about, because that's exactly for me, what the Lyme summit was like, I was in a situation where, okay, I have Lyme, so I need to kill the bacteria. But then I go through this three day long Lyme summit. And now I'm thinking about EMF. Now I'm thinking about getting up at the right time so I can be out in the sun and getting evening sunlight. I'm thinking about putting lemon in my water so I get more minerals and uh, you know, all these different things you, you start to, you start to understand the categories that need to be addressed. Right. And for people who aren't, who don't have a background in natural health, that's the most important thing because in the end, they're going to have to do the work themselves. They're going to have to choose which supplement to buy. What's more important? Should they do the EMF, EMF shielding or should they buy this supplement or this herb? Mm -hmm. They're going to end up having to make those choices and they need to have tools to make those decisions. And mm -hmm. we, we can't uh, give them all the answers, but we can give them the, the, the things they need to think about. And that's really huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That gives them, that give, because that's really how I made it out of Lyme, I feel. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't read. I didn't read a single book about Lyme disease. I didn't. I didn't have any medical background, any kind of. I didn't take any classes other than physiology in undergraduate, uh, which actually helped a lot. Um, but that was the only thing, the only real exposure I had outside of high school biology, right? And it's just time spent in the field, time spent with listening to, reading uh, the posts from people who are putting out information, and then these people are able to think in the right way they've got the map they know where to look and then they can make the decisions for themselves yeah that's awesome i do have a question for you if we can yeah so i'm cause, because in uh in europe there's this tradition of of sanatorium mm -hmm. i don't know if you ever heard of these kind of oases in the mountains where people i mean it, it stems back to way back in the day i think even in the 1800s doctors were sending people with like tuberculosis or mm -hmm. different kind of illnesses out to these sanatoria where there was, you know, there, there were in the mountains, they were exposed to the sun, they were taking baths and spring water and things like that. 
And I really get that feeling being here <laughs> at your homestead. I mean, you've got all these incredible, you know, all this incredible technology, but it's the technology that heals and doesn't harm. And I'm when, when I think of, you know, the opportunities or the, the I'm just wondering where you're headed. Are you, would you be, uh, are you, are you thinking of expanding what you're doing here on the homestead into some kind of like a center where people could come and, and spend time or what have you been planning for the future? If you, <laughs> if you don't mind sharing. Yeah. Well, first step, I'm going to get Neuralink embedded in my brain. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I don't plan on making this a retreat center. At one point I thought about it, but I just like the privacy and the safety of, you know, having, you know, people coming and going in a controlled uh, way. But um, yeah, I guess just my goal is to kind of take homesteading to the next level. Um, like you said, when you first arrived in my driveway, it was, um, that I'm kind of like biohacking homesteading a little bit and yeah. kind of experimenting with different things. Because um, I think that's one thing that's missing in the homesteading community is they're just they're not looking to change how things are done. It's just traditional way of everything of, of slaughtering, growing food, of you know, you name it with all the things that come along with homesteading. But I think there's room for experimentation and things and, and room for upgrading actually to find better ways to do things. Uh, for example, like putting things in the soil, like I think it's uh what is it, electro agriculture there's some term for basically um bumping up the the electricity uh going through the soil where mm -hmm. you're only growing your fruits or vegetables and that's something that i want to dive into um, but largely using lodestones like we know that grounding plants actually um helps their growth and you know versus a potted plant that's disconnected from the earth yeah, you actually right. ground it, it actually has a completely different different uh effect on it um so yeah that's kind of where i'm at and i think this will be the permanent base from what it's looking at looking like <laughs> um but yeah just kind of having fun experimenting and like have the geodesic growing dome coming up in the next several weeks um gonna grow citrus in there in the dead of winter when there's snow on the ground which some people have done you can find wow. youtube videos of guy in the midwest that grew oranges you know and um forget which state it was somewhere where it snows um kansas i think it was or something like that and uh yeah just having fun experimenting and, and trying to just upgrade things i really want to play with uh <laughs> euthanasia <laughs> with the uh, carbon dioxide for the chickens Oh, okay. You know, and see. Um, so I'm just fascinated with that. I've never seen anyone try it or heard of anyone trying yeah. it. And so I definitely like to, once I get a, a good flock going, and, you know, chickens only produce eggs for so many years. Right. Like it's four or five years. And then, you know, they're quote, quote, useless. <laughs> so I'm just cleaning up bugs around. Yeah. So make some, some chicken broth or something out of it. But yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Just a lot of experimentation and, having fun and um, yeah, trying to just up the homestead game a little bit. That's awesome. I, I feel like, I feel like the homesteading aspect of what you're doing really gives you a full context for the health mm -hmm. research, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's different to be researching health and vitamins and minerals uh, and trying to align your diet and, and make your life as natural as possible when you're in a city, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, those things are even going to, it's going to affect you differently. Like, I mean, a coffee in the morning in the city is going to affect you differently than, than coffee in the middle of a forest mm -hmm. where you're totally disconnected from all the technology and all that. So it's, it feels like it's going to I mean, this, this is a, pretty much the start of a journey for you, right? You've mm -hmm. only been here for a while. So mm -hmm. this is a whole new context for you to explore. Mm -hmm. That's cool, man. Well, I wish you all the best. I, I hope, uh, I hope being out here in this beautiful part of America, uh, helps you just to really gain a good insight into into how we work and yeah. provide the best possible information for all of us because we're all i mean a lot of us have gained a lot from you already and, and we look forward to what we can gain from hearing from you in the future i i really appreciate that that's real it's really nice of you to say um yeah i guess i mean i kind of from a prepping perspective too it's uh 
you know, I've looked, and I think we both looked um, in uh, back in history, not what they taught us, and just saw that um, food scarcity and food shortages and manufactured uh, famines have been used a long time to uh, starve um, millions of people. It's a form of uh, warfare that's absolutely probably more effective than mustard gas or whatever else that they've used, carpet bombing, or it's just, I think it's the most affordable way um, for them to genocide a, a group of people like they've done in Europe. And uh, I think a big part of my goal here is to get true for food security, which is a huge undertaking because you can read prepping books and forums and watch YouTube videos and learning about uh, root cellars and, and canning and hunting, foraging, and all of these things that go into retaking your power from the food system that we have, of whole foods, going to the health food store and right. being reliant on the system. And I think we always will be to some degree for some materials, like you have like, you know, be hard for me to harvest sodium chloride from the land here. Right. I don't know if that's possible, you know, pure salt. and um, But a lot of things we can produce ourselves. And so that's kind of my goal here, especially being, you know, quote, fully off grid minus the propane, gasoline and diesel that I use to run machines and a generator sometimes. But in the summer, you know, I'm, I'm on solar hundred percent and that's kind of just a thought experiment that I play with constantly is that if I can't get gas or diesel or propane or any supplies at the health food store anymore or anything ordered to the house, would I be okay? Right. And I feel like that's a really healthy way to be not being stuck in fear or anxiety, but just having that in your head as a possibility. Um, I think a lot of people would lose their minds if, uh, you know, they didn't have access to the grocery store anymore. And I think that's inevitable at some point. I mean, you look at, we didn't get conspiratorial on this show, but Bill Gates buying up all the farmland and um, not all of it, but acres and acres and right. acres. And, people, and I was talking to someone the other day uh, here in Idaho about it. And, and they said, well, when you have all that money and, you know, he just has too much, he doesn't know what to do with it. Like, I think he knows what to do with oh, it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I, that argument didn't make, I didn't, I didn't challenge them in the moment, but in my head, so that doesn't make a lick of sense. Like he just has extra money. So he's buying up farms. It's like, there's, he can create more bioweapons to attack us. <laughs> there's a million other things he could spend that money on. So fix Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So fix Microsoft. Yeah. yeah Windows. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, so for me, you know, I think we're both familiar with the uh, Holodomor genocide, um, Europeans, and like, I mean, there's probably, there's so many other famine or, uh, you know, forced starvations that have occurred around the world um, that it just seems like a pattern. And it's just kind of scary that people are in this fairy tale land of it's never going to happen. Because obviously, it's, if it's happened before, it's obviously possible that it could happen again and probable that it can happen, especially when you look at, you know, the integrity of our, our leaders. Right Absolutely. Now. Yeah. I think, I think the feeling, the benefits that you get from homesteading and taking control of your life. And I'm speaking from no, having no experience doing this, but just with the, with the background of spending a lot of time in nature, gaining skills, uh, being outdoors, knowing how to, survive and 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 operate in the woods or in the mountains having those basic life skills and uh in your case having even more than just basic life skills but being able to be by yourself on this homestead and run this whole operation in a way where you're constantly becoming more independent i can't imagine how beneficial that must be for your nervous system for your psyche because i recall very distinctly the feeling when I started taking control of my health and when I, when I very clearly said to myself, there's no doctor, there's no pharmaceutical that's going to get me out of my issues. I'm going to have to do the work. And when I accepted fully that this is going to be a multiple year process, even though the journey is arduous, the, the, the feeling of control and knowing that now it's in my hands gave me a huge mental boost. 
And I'm sure, you know, at that point, your dopamine's going <laughs> all, all, all over the place. It's, 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 uh, it's pushing you forward. It's giving you the creativity you need to, to, to push through your problems, to think through your problems. But from a psychological and spiritual point of view, also, there's a huge amount of strength that comes from that. And so I think, um, yeah, I mean, what I see, what I see, the, the unspoken message of seeing you here in this context is just the more you know how to do alone with your own hands, the better in every possible way. Right? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And eventually not being alone and <laughs> building a family, uh, very fortunate to have a, a girlfriend now that's incredible. And like, I think, you know, that you hear that argument pro family is like having children to work the farm. <laughs> and I think that was how they're traditionally used is you do need all these hands to do all the things to milk the goats and to carry the water and to chop the wood and to yeah. move things around. And I think that's how things have been done for, for a long time. Um, but I think there is, you know, if, if you're just one person in, in your living by yourself, I think there is a lot um, that you can do um, at least to start. Like I always encourage people, you know, starting somewhere is with a chicken coop and, a, and bees that's like a really easy start but once you get into like cows and goats or sheep and, and getting milk that's a whole nother rabbit hole but just having chickens for eggs and having bees for honey it, it, and wax for for lights for candles is, is yeah. a huge start and that's Definitely. really easy actually right yeah so so then seems like family is the ultimate biohack then. <laughs> right yeah maybe some devices in there <laughs> some methylene blue sprinkled in whatever <laughs> um awesome well uh Jan, this was this was incredible i had so much fun and um really great chatting with you and i'll put um i'll put the link so it's not a website right it's just your channel was it telegram and Instagram you know what? Uh, I have two two main channels on Instagram right now uh, that I that are kind of my preferred communication, and so that's at Johnny Omnivore and at Structure Metabolics with an X at the end. Um, so those are the two main channels. I have a few other alternates, but I'm not really heavily depending on those at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can post about those in the future. Mm -hmm. There is a website, but at this point, it's still in the works, uh, just because of all the other things taking my attention away. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll put that out there once it's ready and I'm mm. up and functioning fully. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's functioning, but it's not <laughs> exactly where I want it to be. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I think you would be a huge resource, uh, whether someone has Lyme or they don't, but especially if they do to reach out and get some guidance and you can probably help them tweak a protocol if they're, if they're experimenting with different things, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, thanks so much. This is my third uh, in-person uh, interview where you're sitting here with me and it was it was a lot of fun. So thanks for coming on again. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really amazing to be on your on your uh, property here, seeing everything you're doing, learning a lot from you. I mean, every every room, there's something <laughs> to be learned and to be uh, explored. So it's really a fascinating place to be. Thank you. It's been great to meet you talk with you. Likewise. Thank you. That is all for today's show. I hope you guys took some notes there. I thought the taurine part was fascinating that taurine restores uh, the ability of the liver to store glycogen and that dosage of five grams daily, at least for men. I love those little tidbits that I pick up in interviews that I have here on the show because it's all just little pieces of the puzzle that I can integrate. I mean, I listen to some podcasts and I don't get one of those for the entire show. There's just no practical information. It's all just big picture stuff. So I appreciate the details that Jan shared and it was really fun to sit next to him and interview him. Like I said, that was my third in-person interview and those are always a lot of fun actually I went back and listened to my first one with chris bayer at the idlewild coffee shop in southern california and 
that was really entertaining to see how far my interview skills have come since then. But if you've been struggling with Lyme disease or know someone that is, highly recommend reaching out to Jan through his Instagram channel, uh, johnny.omnivore. I'll put the link below to that. Or structured metabolics with an X at the end. Or someone that's been low carb that wants to reintroduce carbohydrates. I think he could help coach someone back to being able to do that. I know with Lyme disease, it's so overwhelming with all the different protocols and treatments out there. All the supplements and devices and the timing of it all can get very overwhelming. I thought it was fascinating that he seemed to have used Dr. Lee Cowden's herbal extracts for nine months as the foundation of his Lyme healing protocol. And that apparently worked. So it seems pricey, but if it works, it works. And that's something to look into. If you want to check out my work, you can find that at matt-blackburn.com. Under blogs, I have my CLF protocol. If you click on shop, you can see all of my recommended products. And I want to highlight the Thera O3 ozone and negative ion generator. For 135 bucks, that thing is so versatile. I bring it with me on long car rides and hit the ion button to, so it kicks out negative ions, keeping me more alert and energized uh, during and after the drive. And the ozone feature is really cool. If you want to clean out your car, you can just hit that. I do that when I go into a store, especially if I'm going to be in there a while or at a restaurant. I'll just hit the O3 button and just saturate my car with ozone when I'm not in it. And it's just such a versatile little piece of equipment. You can clean your saunas with it. I mean, sky's the limit with how you can use that thing. And I just really enjoy it still. And my brand is called MitoLife. You can find that at mitolife.co. And we finally released our elk velvet antler. There's still a little bit left if you want to try it out. It's 100% pure uh, velvet antler. I think a lot of people don't even know that this substance exists or where it comes from. I'm very fortunate to have a lake here in Idaho. And in the summer, I can look across my lake and I put out pure sodium chloride salt blocks, just big white salt blocks that attracts them. And they lick the salt and then they go and drink from the lake and then go back and forth. And I get to see them through my binoculars from my window. And I see the elk and the moose and the deer. And they all have antlers that grow. And as they're growing, they actually have a hair. It's called a velvet that covers it. And it's like a fuzz. And it protects the antler as it's growing. And then when the antlers fully developed, they will actually walk through brush, very specific plants, to rub off the velvet. But farmers have been harvesting this for a long time, actually centuries, dating back as early as the Han Dynasty, 200 BC. It's actually a very unique product because you can't really harvest it in the wild. I'm going to experiment with it. When I see a moose getting its velvet off, its antlers, I'll go out there and I'm going to mortar and pestle it and dry it and encapsulate it and take it myself and see if I feel anything. But it's my understanding that that would be too late to get all of the benefits of it. The growth factors and all of the phospholipids and fatty acids and glycolipids and all the really interesting compounds that are found in the velvet you have to harvest it at the right time so i'll put the link below if you want to read the details of how we process it and what benefits you can get from elk velvet i've been taking it for several years and i'm just blown away by how it makes me feel Fun fact is that antlers are some of the fastest growing tissue, some say the fastest growing tissue in the animal kingdom. 
So elk velvet is a renewable resource and animals, the same animal, like the elk or the deer or the moose, will produce it year after year. So thanks for listening. I will see you guys on next Friday's show and stay supercharged. <laughs>